Hello, my name is Mark Smith, online Sunday school teacher at Red House Baptist Church. Welcome to Red House Sunday School. Uh, I hope you all are having a good week, or I hope it's been a good week, according to when, you've watching, when you're watching this. But uh, guys, it's been a good week for, for me so far. We've had uh, good weather, and our garden is producing. We're getting to eat out of that, and uh, it's just kind of cool to kind of see that come in. And spring of the year is always just kind of fun. But our bees are uh, a different story, which for those of you who know who we are, Mark and Pam Smith, um, uh, we've started raising bees this year. And we have no idea what we're doing other than the fact that we have a problem in our hive. Uh, they're, they're building more queen cells. So that's not good. We, one queen can have multiple. So anyway, that's one of the things that we're dealing with. But uh, it's, like I said, it's been a good week. We're getting a lot of things done. And spring's always a great time of year for us. So, and I hope it's a great time of year for you as well. And I know whatever's going on in your lives, um, things can be tough. I get that, I understand that because we all go through it. There, there are seasons, but uh, just want you to know that you can trust in God, you can put your life in his hands, and no matter what happens, uh, you can be secure in the knowledge that Jesus has already paid the price for your sins and that God loves you that much that he gave his son to die on the cross for you. So there's nothing you can't get through because we know that we have a loving God who's, who's already done everything he can for us and he continues to work in our lives. There are some people who think, no, that, that doesn't happen, but it absolutely does. And I think most of us can probably attest to that uh, if we're being honest. So just be honest. Uh, how about that? So anyway, also a quick little plug. Um, we are in Sunday school at Red House Baptist Church, live and in person. Grace and Truth is the name of our Sunday school class. We are in the gymnasium for now. and We'll be there for a while, probably at least through the summer. Um, and we would love to have you come join us. If you're watching these and you think, you know what, we want to get back into church or uh, we want to go to church for the first time. Come on, we would absolutely love to have you. Our, our Sunday school starts at 9.15 and worship service starts at 10.45. Brother Darren Cobb has been preaching through Psalm, uh, the Psalms and they've been inspiring. And uh, guys, we just absolutely love to have you. And just if nobody knows who you are, if you're visiting for the first time, just come up and introduce yourself and we'll try to do the same. Uh, so. Anyway, we'd love to have you. Please come join us at, at Red House where we study God's word and we worship him. And uh, Brother Shama Loridan is, is leading us in worship. And we've got Brother Dwayne uh, Abrahamson, who's leading the youth and has for years and years. And Linda Coulter, who is leading our children's. We have a wonderful children's program. We have uh, vacation Bible school coming up. So a lot of things going on at Red House Baptist. And we would absolutely love to have you. So there, I, I've said that. Uh, let me go ahead and just tell you this as well. I use Explore the Bible, which is put out by Lifeway. We've got this week and then more, one more week in the book of Luke. We're in the last chapter of Luke right now. And then we will uh, be back in the Old Testament. We'll be in Job and in Ecclesiastes. So um, some of you may look at that and go, oh, Old Testament, it's kind of boring. No, it's not. It, it's awesome. And all of the Bible points towards Jesus. So uh, again, just, just where we are. Let's go ahead and get started in, into today's lesson, and let's start with a word of prayer. So uh, just wherever you are, bow in a word of prayer with me. Heavenly Father, we just once again come before you humbled by the fact that you have given your only son to die on the cross for each and every one of us. And that, Father God, if we would just accept that and we would just uh, turn our lives over to you, that Father God, you will save us not only for now, but for all eternity, that death will no longer have a grip on our lives because we'll die to our old lives, be raised in a new life with you. Lord God, the assurance of that gives me such hope. Uh, and even in the times of turmoil that God, I just know that I can trust in you. And for that, I'm very thankful. Father God, we also wanna lift up each of the prayer requests that are on our hearts. Father, those who've been mentioned at church and in our Sunday school class and on the different prayer lists, Father, we lift each of those up to you. And we know that you are in control and that, Father God, you can do anything. But, Father God, all of this, I pray, that is in your will, not ours. Father God, we pray that you would be with us as we study your word today. Father, we pray that you would forgive us of the sinfulness 
in our lives. And that, Father God, we would um, glorify you with the lives that we live. We pray each of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, uh, yes, the title of today's lesson is Revealed. And it's Luke 24, verses 18 through 31. But I can't do that. So, you know, there, there are some other things we need to go to the background, and then we need to go a little bit farther, and we'll, we'll do those things. I'll read through that as we go through today's lesson. But the subtitle of today's lesson is Jesus Reveals His Identity to Those Seeking Him. So Jesus is going to reveal who He is to us and our hearts and our minds if we're seeking Him, if we, if we want to find Him. Now, if we don't want to find Him, you know, that, that's just maybe something that we hide. So just kind of bear that in mind as we get ready to go through today's lesson. So just as an introduction, and I, I put that copy of that book up there. I don't know how many of you all have that or have books similar to that. Uh, more modern books say, you know, like plumbing for dummies or computer for dummies or you know, all of those types of things, which is me. I, I'm pretty dumb. But can you recall something that used to be very difficult for you, but has gotten easier over time? something that maybe you struggled with for a period of time, but now it's just old hat. You, you, you don't have any troubles with it anymore. So, you know, I'm not as gifted a craftsman or a fixer-upper uh, as I would like to be, okay? In fact, I'm really not at all. But as a homeowner, I've had to get better at multiple tasks as things happen around the house or I'll go broke. And when I say I'll go broke, I mean that literally. I mean, it, I'd be penniless. All right, so the first time I installed a ceiling fan, that's one of the things that in the very first home that we had, I wanted my wife wanted to put in a ceiling fan, and I did too. So uh, we went and bought one, and I thought, well, rather than hiring an electrician, I can do this. And it took me about an entire day to do that. Um, and and it, it meant assembling, putting it up, and getting ready to put another part on and finding out I did this wrong. I should have put this on first and then that, but that's not the way it looked. And then, you know, there were all sorts of things. So I had to disassemble, reassemble, and you know how that goes. You probably know how that goes. And subsequent similar tasks have gotten easier. You know, I can put up a ceiling fan in maybe 30 minutes now. So, and, and we're finding that beekeeping is kind of similar to that. We don't know much, but we are learning pretty quickly because we have to, you know, th there's not much of a choice because um, nobody else is going to come take care of it. That's not entirely true. We've got a guy that we uh, kind of lean on that is coming over actually tonight to try to help us take care of some problems. But can you think of a problem or a task in which you had an aha moment? It's like, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have any idea. And then all of a sudden it just hits you and the light comes on. You're like, yes, now I know what's going on. Now I understand. And in school, uh, some of you may have been thinking of the same thing, uh, but in school, I struggled with certain concepts, generally when it came to upper level maths. And when I say upper level, I mean something beyond addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, okay? I'd be trying to solve a math problem, and I'd look back at an old problem and, and try to figure out how you got to that, and I just couldn't understand what the next step was or even why it was important. And that was one of the things I finally got to is I was, I couldn't understand it. Where am I going to use this anyway? That's, that's dumb. I'm never going to use this. Then it turns out my last year in the classroom, last year, almost, well, no, it was probably, uh, you know, sometime, uh, you know, at the end of the semester and the kid was asking me, how do you figure out your grade? I don't understand how I figure out my grade. And while explaining it, I was writing it on the, on the white erase board. And I was using my marker and I was saying, okay, so you take whatever score you have here, you multiply it by four because that's the number you've got. And then you add whatever the score was and, I, and then I'd write, and all of that is divided by this number. And as I was explaining it, I stood back and I said, no guys, it's pretty simple. I mean, if you'll just do this, then I looked at the board and I thought, I just did algebra. No directions, just did algebra. So finally, after 30 years of teaching in the classroom, a reason for algebra. That was an aha moment. So uh, some of you may be in a similar boat. Some of you may be going, gosh, that guy really is stupid. Uh, but today we're going to see how Jesus's identity, who Jesus is, was triggered 
and revealed after the resurrection. Because you got to remember, guys, in our last lesson, if you saw the last lesson, we talked about Jesus's death on the cross. And after someone dies, we, we bury them. And that's what happened to Jesus. He was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And, and it was just understood as disciples, hey, he's, he's gone. He's dead. So uh, that's where we're going to kind of pick up in Luke chapter 24. And I'm going to back up a little bit. Uh, it says we're going to pick up in verse 18. But I'm going to go back to verse 13 because it, it kind of lays the groundwork here. So follow along with me if you have your Bible or your phone app. And I'm in Luke chapter 24, beginning in uh, verse 13 through, uh, through verse 24. Now that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together, they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked them, what is this dispute that you are having with each other as you were walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. The one named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? Jesus asked them. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported what they had seen and vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were there with us at the tomb, uh, with us, went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. So a uh, little lengthy set of verses, but all of that is important, guys. So when we look at verse 13, it says, now that same day, two of them were on their way to the village called Emmaus. Two of whom were on their way to Emmaus? Well, two of the disciples were on their way to Emmaus. And then some of you probably looked at that. You said, I don't remember Cleopas as one of the disciples. Well, guys, you got to understand that Jesus had at least hundreds of disciples, okay? So remember the disciples were followers of Jesus, not the ones he necessarily called to be part of his inner circle and then became the apostles, okay? So they're, they're not two of the 11 remaining apostles, but they are disciples of Jesus. They, they are followers of Jesus Christ. So what were they doing as they walked the seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus? And again, it's important that we understand the, the context of all of this. So if you wanted to get from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and maybe that's where they were from, they're disciples of Jesus, maybe they're going back home to Emmaus. Uh, you don't catch a taxi, you don't call an Uber, you walk. That's that's what you do. Seven miles, eh, it's not that far. Uh, from what I've read in, in the uh, quarterly that's put out, that, that may be a three or four mile uh, hour journey, and they're walking and they're talking. What were they doing? They're talking about the events of the day. Guys, and the way I looked at it, it's kind of like, in, in, in my way of looking at it, kind of like 9-11. If you'll remember, uh, after 9-11, the days and the weeks and even the months following 9-11, that's basically all we talked about. We'd discuss it. We'd say, who was it in the early days? Why would someone do this? Is this a terrorist attack? If it is, what terrorist group? Nobody's coming forward saying, it's us. Yeah, you know, and, and we would talk about it and we would even argue about, you know, why this happened and what's the significance of all of it. And guess the same thing is going on with these two disciples. So who joined them as they were walking along together, discussing and arguing on this road? Well, Jesus, that's what it says. Jesus himself was walking along with them. Well, why did they not celebrate his resurrection? These are disciples of Jesus. These are followers of Jesus. Why weren't they saying, look, there's Jesus, okay? Because they didn't recognize him. You see, Jesus, Jesus is dead. They had seen it happen, okay? They were blown away that this man that they didn't recognize as Jesus 
was asking them about the details. What are you guys talking about anyway? What, what is all that? Okay. Guys, you've got to understand Jesus was walking in the same direction. So he had to be coming from Jerusalem if he's on the road to Emmaus. Okay. So he's headed from Jerusalem, same direction. And he's asking them what they're talking about. All right, so how did Cleopas respond to Jesus's question? So if we get to verse 18 here, it says the one named Cleopas answered him and he said, and I'll find this, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? How can you not know? He was shocked that he's even asking the question about what is it you're talking about? Because it's the third day after this has happened. It's what everybody is talking about. Okay. It's the third day after the crucifixion of Jesus. Everybody knows what happened. It could not have been missed. Yet here's this quote unquote stranger asking them what this is about. Since Jesus persisted, you know, I want to know, you know, tell me what things, how did the disciples describe what had happened? And this is important. It's all important, but it's important. But they told the stranger who was the topic of conversation and they identified him as a prophet. And I, I think that's telling, okay? And, and I guess it's not a slam. It's not because prophets were very well respected, all right? But they didn't identify him as the Messiah. They identified him as a prophet. He's powerful, right? great speaker. He's a man of God. That's who he is. So it's not as if they were slamming him, but they didn't properly identify him. They also explained that the Jewish leaders had him sentenced and crucified. All right, so they, they explained these things to the man that they see as a stranger. And I want you to notice that, you know, in the picture that I put up there, there's a crowd of people. This is during the Passover, okay? So, so, or it's right before the Passover, but people are in Jerusalem for Passover. So there are huge crowds. Everybody knows what's going on. What had the disciples hoped about Jesus? And it says it right here in these verses. What were they hoping? They were hoping that he was the Messiah. They had hoped that Jesus of Nazareth had been the one to redeem Israel. But, and that's an important word, but their hopes seem to be dashed in this moment. Guys, are people still blinded to encounters with Jesus? Because these two disciples, they're blinded by him. Surely people aren't still blinded by these, these meetings with Jesus because these meetings still exist and they're constantly blinded because they see what they want to see or they attribute things to luck or to chance or to science or to nature. But they don't see the hand of God because they're blind, just like these two disciples. Well, sure, they, I mean, their, their sight's good enough to see the road and to see the steps that they need to take, because they can't see the important thing, which is the resurrected Jesus standing, walking, talking to them. They're blinded to that. Their hearts are blinded to that, and their minds are as well. So, guys, verses 22 through 24 seem to be very, very promising, all right, and exciting, because when we look at this, it's moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb. When they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen angels who said he is alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb, and they found just like what the women had said. The tomb is empty. All right, so that's exciting. But they didn't seem excited, did they? They seemed dejected. They just described the resurrection to the stranger on the road. And rather than being excited and joyous, they're disappointed. Uh, it's all been very, very sad. Crucified Jesus, now we can't find his body. What did they miss in their own description of events? Because they described the resurrection. What did they miss there, guys? So witnesses who were there saw the empty tomb. They described an encounter with heavenly creatures, with angels. They were told by angels. And I guess there's no doubt in their minds that these angels appeared to these women, but they were told by these angels that Jesus is alive. And two of Jesus, 
Jesus' closest followers, his apostles, Peter and John, had confirmed everything that the women had said, that the tomb is empty. Praise God. No, not praise God. But they didn't see him. They didn't see Jesus. That's what they were stuck on. What's the significance of the empty tomb? And how can we share that with those who don't know Jesus? Guys, the empty tomb is the key to all of this, all right? Not the birth of Jesus. That's, that's certainly important, guys. I'm not, I'm not minimizing these things. I'm not minimizing anything that Jesus did. But the key is the empty tomb because that means that we worship and follow a risen Savior. He's alive. Uh, Richard, friend of mine in our Sunday school class, had uh, said, you know, Mark, you need to watch Bodie Bauckham. You know, here's a guy that uh, he explains the significance of this better than anybody he had ever heard. Okay. And, and I did. I watched a video of his and it is so, so good. And I would, uh, you know, any of you who want to do that, it's, it's worth watching. But there's no other religion. There's no other philosophy or belief system that claims to worship a risen Savior, defeated death. Now, some of them are saying, you know, we're waiting for this to happen. Jesus has already done this. On the third day, he did what he said he would do. We don't worship a statue. We don't worship some crazy set of beliefs. We worship a Lord who is alive. Yes, that is the single most significant thing in all of this. Without the empty tomb, there's not a whole, I shouldn't say, there's, the empty tomb is the key. It absolutely is. So let's go ahead and look at the next set of scripture verses. And it's verses 25 through 27. He said to them, how unwise and slow you are to believe in your hearts all that the prophets have spoken. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. That is so cool. All right. So why did Jesus say that these disciples were foolish? All right? And this translation doesn't say that. It says unwise. But in other translations, it, it says foolish. All right. Because they didn't see what had happened. They heard Jesus say that this would happen. They heard out of his mouth, Jesus say that he had to die. He had to be buried and he would have to rise on the third day. They heard all of that. They didn't understand. That, okay. They knew that the scripture had foretold these events, that this had to happen. They didn't see that. The prophets described these events about the Messiah, but they were so grieved and they allowed their hearts to cloud their minds. They missed that. And Jesus is calling them out. He's saying, guys, you're not seeing what's right before you. So why was it so difficult for them to believe that the Messiah had been humiliated and crucified? Because that's part of the problem. They're saying, you know, if he was the Messiah, if he's the Savior, he wouldn't have been treated like that, okay? He's supposed to be a conqueror. He's supposed to, to be the Savior of Israel. They're expecting something different. Jesus had told them what to expect. The prophets had told them what to expect. The scripture told them what to expect. Yet they'd stuck in their own minds. Oh, he's going to be a king. He's going to be a conqueror. Instead, he was ridiculed and he was belittled. He was just a man. As they're, and I bet that's something that they were discussing and arguing is, you know, if he's really the Messiah, you know, if, if he's really the son of God, the son of man, why is he dead? That doesn't make any sense to them. Why was the cross necessary, though, for Jesus to save us? Because he said it was, all right? because he had to enter into his glory. The cross was the only way for us to be forgiven. The blood of Jesus is what cleanses us of our sins. Yes, Jesus had to be glorified to make the way, the only way for us to be saved. That is the only way. If there are, enough, if there, if there are other ways, Jesus' uh, sacrifice on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, they weren't needed because there are other ways. Guys, I'm telling you, there is no other way. So I, I'm not just telling you. The Bible tells us that. Jesus tells us that. He is the only way. 
So how did Jesus spend the rest of their time together on the road? I love this part. So because this is a long walk, right? So how did he spend the time? He was teaching. He was explaining. Rather than saying, come on, you morons, look, it's me, it's Jesus. He taught them. He's pouring himself into them. And he spoke with expertise. They, they knew that. And that's important because they were blown away by his knowledge. And you would say, well, how do you know that? How do you know they were blown away by his knowledge? And the reason I know that is by reading on. When we look at verses 28 through 31. They came near the village where they were going. And he gave the impression, this is Jesus, gave the impression that he was going farther. But they urged him, stay with us because it's almost evening and now the day is almost over. So we went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to him. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. Now I'm going to go ahead and read on a little bit farther here. I hope that's okay. Weren't our hearts ablaze within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scripture to us? That's how I know. That very hour, as it's getting dark and as they recline, so it's probably completely dark now. That very hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered together who said, The Lord has certainly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And the apostles certainly would have remembered the breaking of the bread because that was their last time with Jesus they broke bread. So all of these things are starting to come together. They're not all going to understand them right now, but time and time and time again, Jesus reveals himself to them. So when they reach Emmaus, their destination, what did they do? Well, Jesus acted like I'm heading on. He knew that there was a divine appointment, but Jesus acted like, all right, yes, great talking to you. But rather than saying goodbye, the disciples invited this stranger. You come in and stay with us. Come stay with us. It's dark. It's the it's end of the day. It's dangerous out there. You don't want to be on the streets any longer. Come on, you stay with us. All right? They want more. That's what they want. They want more. Why'd they do this? They knew something about this man. They weren't sure what that was. But he spoke authoritatively. And they were intrigued and wanted to know more. It's as if they were trying to make excuses for Jesus to stay with them. It's almost dark. You don't want to be out after dark. You know, I don't know how much they were concerned about his safety, but they were definitely concerned about wanting to have this man continue to teach them. He taught with such authority. How does Jesus, this is so important, how does Jesus respond to their request? This is another just key point here. He agrees. Jesus wasn't invited to stay and then said, no, I need to go on. They said, Jesus, we want more of you. We want you in our home. So how does Jesus always respond to those who ask Jesus to stay with them? He always agrees. And that's who Jesus is. He wants to stay with us and dwell with us and dwell in us. He wants permanent residence in our hearts because he loves us. That's an amazing truth. That's not an opinion. That's a truth. And guys, the only thing it takes for Jesus to come dwell in our hearts is an invitation. Just ask him. Jesus, I want more of you. I don't ever want you to leave me. I want you to come into my heart and I want to follow you. If you pray that, Jesus will do that. He'll do that right now. All right? And you will be saved. That's, that's what it takes. That's why Jesus did what he did. All right? So would it have been clearer to the disciples about the identity of Jesus once they got inside if they just turned the lights on? Just go inside. That's what we do. We come in, dark, turn on the lights. Well, that's kind of a stupid question because uh, there are no lights to turn on, okay? They have no electricity. They would have candles and they would have lamps, but that would be dim. They're, they, it would be so dim, it'd be hard for them to see. So really, it's not about physically being able to see Jesus, 
okay? Their hearts and minds were closed. They were clamped shut, like this picture of this girl. She's got them tightly closed, okay? Why, did, though, did they finally recognize him? Well, because their eyes were opened, okay? Not because of something Jesus said or necessarily because of something Jesus did, other than their eyes were opened. They couldn't see Jesus because their hearts had prevented them from seeing who he was. Once their eyes were opened, they could see clearly. In the dark, they could see clearly. What did they do? So it says that in, in here that, that they saw Jesus, they were aware that this was Jesus with them, and then immediately Jesus disappears. They're breaking bread. They're eating dinner with Jesus. Jesus is gone. So did they go thought it was him, or that must have just been a vision or something of that nature. Uh-uh, that's not what they did. They immediately went back to Jerusalem. So remember, the road to Jeruz from Jerusalem to Emmaus, they're like, Jesus, come on in here. This is dangerous. It's dark. They didn't care that it was dark. They didn't care that they had just gone seven miles, three or four hours of walking. It's time to go back, all right? They had to go tell what happened. How should that inspire believers today? So if you are a believer, if you are a born again Christian, how should this inspire you? Well, we should want to tell others about our encounters with Jesus. We don't need to open their eyes. We don't need to convince them of who Jesus is. It's not our task. We share Jesus. We share Jesus with other people and what he's done in our lives, in the Holy Spirit, will work on their hearts and work on their eyes. Not our job, but we are to share Jesus with others. Guys, I hope if you don't know Jesus, if you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior, that this very day you'll do that. I, I, that is my hope and prayer. But if you have, and you, and you do have him as your Lord and Savior, I hope you'll share him with others. Guys, thank you for sharing this time with me, and I hope you have a great, great day. Thank you.